Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord this morning. Give him glory. It's going to be another wonderful time in the presence of the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. and We will rejoice and we are going to be glad in it. The word of God says, I was glad unto me. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. Even though the only chance we get is to collaborate uh, cross, -geographic, cross geographically with the technology that God has given our generation. Nonetheless, it is the house of the Lord. So we want to welcome you to church. Pull your faith and pull your expectations to the table and let us try to study at the feet of Jesus today. Hallelujah. Bless the name of, of the Lord. So this is Church of Hero Smart and we are going to get started with the Word of God. And as you all know, Hero Smart is a ministry set up by God for the discipleship of the nations in keeping with the instruction of Jesus in Matthew chapter 28 which says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. And lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. And in keeping with that instruction, uh, in Hewer Smart, we have carved out a set of studies from the Word of God that we um, have titled the Online Discipleship Program, or the ODP in short. And the ODP can be classified into four major categories. There is something that we've called the pharmacy or the medicine aspect of the Word of God. There is another thing that we've called the milk aspect of the Word of God. There is something we've called the meat aspect of the Word of God, or the solid food aspect of the Word of God. And there is another thing that we've called the water section of the Word of God. And in coming through this particular study of the of the online discipleship program since 2017 God has been faithful God has helped us to unravel certain things about the lifestyle of Jesus certain things that will position us to leave above circumstances to leave in the holy of holies we've come through the pharmacy section of the word of God we've come through the milk section of the word we've come through the meat section of the word of God we are currently doing a little touch on the water section of the word of God and today we are still going to be talking about another another aspect of the word of God that we can call the water part of the word of God and just like we said in one of our messages um, spiritual groceries the water aspect of it specifically we talked about how you can identify certain qualities certain scriptures certain concepts of the word of God as the water section of the word of God based on the evidence of the scripture in Proverbs chapter 27 and I'm going to try to get started with that again so if you got your Bible in your hand Please turn to Proverbs chapter 27. We are going to appreciate a critical, critical quality of water that we can use to identify water concepts from the Word of God. Critical quality, a critical quality of water. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 27 and in verse 19 it says, As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. You may be reading from, from King James or from the, from the Amplified. But whatever version you're talking about, you will appreciate that the Holy Spirit is trying to drive home here to us that there is a critical concept, a critical quality of water that we can call face reflection. It says, as water reflects the face of a man, so a man's heart is going to reflect him. So if we understand that there are certain portions of the Word of God that we can call water, then those portions of the Word of God will reflect the face of the believer back to the believer. And if I identify those portions of the Word of God which are reflecting my face back to me, then I have identified the water aspect of the Word of God. And just like in the natural, you can use water to quench the thirst of your, of, your, of your physical systems. You can use water to wash your body. In the same way you can use water to quench the thirst of your spiritual systems, you can use the water of the Word of God to wash your spiritual systems. And we talked about how you're going to do that uh, in the spiritual groceries message. I'm not going to go over that. I want to I want to encourage you to go back to the spiritual groceries message to refresh that understanding or better still go back to the notes you took while you were listening to that message. But this scripture is going to be really pertinent to what we are going to be talking about today with regards to face reflection. 
The Bible says, as water reflects a face, so a man's heart is going to reflect, reflect him. And today we are going to be talking about your image in God's eyes. That's going to be the water concept of the word of God that we are going to be talking about today. And this scripture is going to be really cardinal to helping you to understand the way God sees you right now. To helping me to understand the way God sees me. And subsequently understanding and appreciating the way God sees you and me in the New Testament is going to position you to win in all situations. Hallelujah. Your image in God's eyes. So God says over here that water is going to reflect the face of a man to him. It's going to reflect the image of the believer to him. So the question is, what is your image that the water of the word of God is going to be reflecting back to you? Your image is documented in 1 John chapter 4 in verse 17. From God's standpoint, who are you right now? Who are I from God's standpoint? Let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. You are not defined by your own image in your mind at the moment. You are defined by the image in the heart of the Father for you. 1 John chapter 4 and in verse 17. Glory to God. It says here, it says, in this way, God's love is made complete or perfect among us, for we have confidence, um, and so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, because in this world, we are like him. The Bible says, in this world, we are like him. In fact, the King James Version of the Bible, I'm just going to read it verbatim over here. It says, herein is love made perfect, or the NIV in another part of NIV, or maybe New King James. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. This scripture reveals to the believer that in this world, we are just like Jesus, Yahushua, right now, seated at the right of the Father. Hallelujah. Now, to, for you to appreciate how really, really important that particular statement is, we are going to be looking at the status of Jesus prior to his resurrection, the status of Jesus after his resurrection, and by extension, God's expectation is for you to see yourself in the status of Jesus after his resurrection, and that will constitute the image of the Father for you right now on the side of eternity. Why is that important? In God's eyes, you got to understand that you are just like Yahushua right now, seated at the right hand of the Father. In God's eyes, you are far above principalities and powers and over the rulers of the darkness of this world. Hallelujah. God has a lot of faith in you. He's got a lot of faith in me. That's the reason the book of Psalms can say he's going to prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemies. It takes a faithful God and a God that has a lot of faith in you to do that. Say, so I want to put my children in the territory of the adversary, right in the midst of the adversary and everything is working out. And yet, they will eat in the face of the adversary and the adversary is not going to have anything to do with it because I believe in them. God's got certain thought processes about you. He's got certain thought processes about me. And God is asking you through this message to elevate your thought processes to the thought processes of the Father who created you. Hallelujah. The people of the world are going to just try to take a look at you. So what do you think you are? You're walking around the street and stomping the street like your father knows. Father holds the world. If somebody were to tell you that, you need to tell them, you got that part right. My father really holds the world. And I'm giving you the invitation. You can come over to my side and let my father be your father as well. You can stomp around like your father holds the world because, indeed, the creator of the ends of the earth, who is our father, holds the world. And from his standpoint, he's not going to be intimidated by the challenges that you're going through right now. And he doesn't expect you to be intimidated by the challenges you may be going through or the challenges the devil thinks is going to sling your circumstances. God does not expect you to be intimidated. God is not intimidated. And God is not nervous about it. 
Oh, well, I put them in the enemy territory right now. There are thousands of demon spirits all around them. I'm, 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 I'm nervous about them. No, God's not nervous. He believes in you. Why? Because he thinks he sees you in the image of Jesus right now seated at the right of the Father. Let's look at a couple more scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. Glory to God. This message is to elevate your mindset. We touched on it in the water aspect of spiritual growth for several months ago. But we are going to delve deeper into, into this message today to quench the thirst of your spiritual systems, to wash your minds so that you can live out the status of Yahushua, seated on the right of the Father, your image in God's eyes. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. Um, hallelujah. It says, which he exerted in Christ, talking about the power of God which he ex exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of majesty in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in that which is to come and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So God says over there that Jesus he is the head of the church and God has made Yahushua to be seated far above all principalities and powers at the right hand of the heavenly realms. Yahushua is the head and is seated over there. And in verse 6 of, of Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says, And God raised us up together with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So God says over there that you're not just going to be sitting here on earth, but you are sitting together where your head is seated. And that makes logical sense. So my head right now is currently seated somewhere in Texas. But so is my body. So is my arm. So is my left arm. So is my right arm. So are my legs. So is every part of my body. Every part of my body is seated right now where my head is seated. And the same thing is going to be applicable to you and to me in this new, 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 new testament in Christ Jesus. Let's look at another scripture, Revelation chapter one and verse eighteen. Glory to God. Your image in God's eyes. Who do you think you are in the eyes of the Father? Yahushua says in verse eighteen of Revelation chapter one. It says, "I am the living one." And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. So Jesus says, I am alive forever, and I hold the keys of hell and death. And as you're going to know through the study, is transferred the authority over to the members of the body of Christ to use the name of Jesus. So you're not sitting together with some pauper. You're not sitting in the, in the camp or in the territory of some person who doesn't have the ability to orchestrate circumstances and enforce righteousness, peace, and joy in your life. No, you are sitting right now. Far above all principalities and powers, and you've got the highest clouds in creation together with Jesus, Yahushua, Hamashiach, because you're a member of the body of Christ. That's the way God sees you. God's not going to look at Jesus being the head separate from the body. He sees this large colossus that we can call the body of Jesus. And that's the reason you're going to see the vision that God gave John in the book of Revelation when he sees the church of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 12 rising up. He doesn't see just the head of the church rising up. He sees the church rising up as a body strong, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And she's going to spit out a man child. And the man child is going to be cut off the throne of God. You are part of that body and position that you are right now at the right hand of majesty. On high, see yourself the way God sees you. You are a member of the body of the Messiah, and you are positionally seated where the head is located. You are not defined by the current circumstances, 
or people's view of you, especially if those things are not consistent with the way Yahushua is right now. And for your information, even you are not just like the pre-resurrection status of Jesus. Your status in the realm of the Spirit is like Yahushua's status right now post-resurrection. Your status is not like Jesus' status prior to resurrection. Your status is Jesus' status after resurrection, post-resurrection. The most glorified status of Jesus is what God is inviting you, based on 1 John 4, 17, to see yourself like right now, seated at God's right hand, far above all principalities and powers. Now to appreciate this switch of attitudes, this status that God wants you to see yourself right now, you got to appreciate that Jesus, Yahushua's status before his resurrection was a whole lot different from his status after his resurrection. And even though you may see him as seemingly okay for me to settle with the status of Jesus prior to his resurrection, you'll appreciate it is important for you not to settle for the status of Jesus before his resurrection. you got to set your sights on the status of Jesus after his resurrection because Jesus himself 2,000 years ago wasn't looking at his status prior to his resurrection. He was looking at his status after his resurrection. It's the reason the word of God is going to say, Yahushua, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he's now seated on the right of the Father. Why? Because he's looking behind the cross. He walked the shoes of this planet over 2,000 years ago, and he never saw himself the way everybody around him was seeing him. And they got mad at him because of that. What do you think you are, Jesus? We know that you are the son of a carpenter. We know that you are from Nazareth and nothing good is going to come out of Nazareth. And they expected Jesus to see himself the way they were seeing him. Yahushua said, no, I am together with God, my father, in the heavenly places. As the father has life and himself is granted life to the son. And is given the son authority to give life to anybody who submits to the son. I can see the Father and I do exactly what my Father says I need to do. Jehoshua was seeing himself seated at the right hand of the Father, even though 2,000 years ago he was walking over in the nation of Israel. And God is giving you that invitation. God's giving me that invitation to see ourselves right now as Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. So we need to appreciate the difference between Jesus prior to his resurrection and Yahushua after his resurrection. So we're going to look at certain qualities right now that can make us see that there is a vast difference between Jesus prior to his resurrection and Jesus after his resurrection. The first quality that Yahushua had when he was here on earth before his resurrection was that he was tempted over 2,000 years ago and he was vulnerable to temptations during his walk on earth in every way but yet without sin. You all know that scripture but for the sake of emphasis let's try to turn to it. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. You are going to see that Jesus while he was here he was vulnerable to temptations even though he didn't sin. Now Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 15 it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted, who has been, you may want to underline that, who has been, or your translation may say, who was tempted in every way, just like as we are, and yet was without sin. So Yahushua, when he was on this side of eternity, was vulnerable to temptations. And that's the reason we can have documentations of his wilderness of experience, wilderness of temptation experience. How the devil tempted Yahushua three times after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. We can have the Garden of Gethsemane documented for us how the devil was trying to tempt Jesus to abort the plan of redemption. From the start of his ministry to the end of his ministry, his status was being vulnerable to temptations. But right now, things have changed. 
after his resurrection from the dead, Yahushua is no longer vulnerable to temptations. How do we know that? Turn right now to the book of James. In James chapter 1, glory to God. It says, when, in verse 13, it says, When tempted, no one shall say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. If you've got a paper copy of the Bible in your hands, I want to invite you to underline that verse 13. It says, For God cannot be tempted. So after Yahushua was uh, raised from the dead, he entered back into his God status. Based on the evidence of Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says that he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but he let it go temporarily. And he submitted himself even to the death on the cross, but now he's died and he's been resurrected, so right now equality with God in his status has been given back to him. So he entered back into his God status. So when he was walking here on earth, he operated here on earth as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit and power. And when he died and he was resurrected, he stepped out of that state, of that status, back into his God status. And this scripture in John chapter, in James chapter 1 and verse 13 will now be applicable to Yahushua's status right now after his resurrection. What is that status? God cannot be tempted by evil. Underline that word. For God cannot. The word over there is can not. It is a will not, or maybe he's not going to fall after he's been tempted. No, but the Bible says he cannot. His senses right now are completely numb to sin stimuli. That's the status of Jesus right now. If you were to go right now to Jesus and to Yahushua after he was raised from the dead, and you try to suggest to him, jump off the cliff or do this and all that, his senses are numb to it. Cannot be tempted again. That is a huge status change. And guess what? God says you need to see yourself like that. Whoa. <laughs> oh, you want to tell me? I want I need to see myself as a person who cannot who cannot be tempted anymore. Yes. I, you, need, you need to tell me I need to see myself with my senses completely numb to sin, to will for disobedience, and to treason stimuli. Exactly. But that's not true. Oh, hush it a little bit. What is truth? What you feel is not the truth. What is the truth is what the Word of God says concerning you. And the Bible says in this situation that Jesus, in his God status, cannot be tempted anymore. And now Romans chapter 6. Let's look at it. Glory to God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 10 and verse 11 now gives you the charge that you need to count yourself to be dead indeed out of sin. In fact, let me back up to Romans chapter 6 and verse 8 to reiterate the point that James chapter 1 and verse 13 was trying to make for us. Romans chapter 6 and verse 8 says, Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. You got a pen in your hands, underline that verse of scripture. The Bible says when Jesus died, he didn't just die physically, he died to sin as well. What does that mean? His senses became numb to sin. And that was not the status he had at the wilderness of temptation experience. That's not the status he had at the Garden of Gethsemane. But right now the Bible says when he died, he didn't just die physically, he became completely numb to sin. Now the word of God says but the life he lives right now he lives to God. And in verse 11 it says in the same way count yourselves dead indeed under sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So the charge right now is given to you and to me to elevate your mindset to see yourself dead to sin as well. Oh 
Look, how my senses don't feel numb to sin. It doesn't matter what you're what you're feeling in your senses. It doesn't matter what you're thinking in your mind. It doesn't matter what your neighbor is telling you, what this person is telling you. What matters is what the Word of God says about you. With regards to being dead to sin, you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a status change. And you need to start thinking like that so that you can enforce the reality of that status in your experience every day, especially when you pray the kingdom through. That's your image in God's eyes. So that's a huge status change from Yahushua before his resurrection to Yahushua after his resurrection. And this passage is trying to get you to start elevating your mind and your mindset to start seeing yourselves as Jesus after his resurrection. Glory to God. Uh, but I, I just can't process that. Just hang on a minute. I'm going to tell you the reason it's important for you to start thinking like that. Because if you don't think like that, you will never live it. If you don't see yourself right now dead to sin, you don't see yourself walking around dead completely numb, not vulnerable to sin stimuli anymore, you will not be uh, able to overcome the darkness of the world even though you are in the midst of it. When you pray every morning, and you desire the word. These are scriptures that we've given you instructions to pick and to create on your knees. One of the ways that you are going to realize the status of Jesus and enforce this condition is to superimpose this, high, this higher form of reality on whatever is going on in your conduct and circumstances and worlds. You are going to take the scripture. The word of God says, I'm a dead man of sin. I'm a lot to God in Christ Jesus. You are going to desire that word. When you want to pray, you are going to paint a picture of that word. I want to see the status realized in the realm of the natural in my life today. And then you pray the word. You believe the word. You switch over right now to your, to, to your attitude of believing and confessing and meditating. I'm jumping a little bit myself right now, but God told me to say that real quickly so that you can know that there is great, great, great victory for you if you operate like this. See yourself the way Jesus is right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities and powers, including the sin that the devil is trying to dog your heels with. You're far above it. Super, super far above it. You're far above treason because you're a dead man to see. Later, if God gives us an opportunity, we are going to do some a little uh, drama and a play. Like you're going to see the, the symbol of a dead person. If you see a, see a dead person right here, and you start slapping the dead person. You start bringing around and spraying perfume on his body. You start doing all kinds of things. They're not going to yield to you. Why? Because they're dead. You need to paint that picture in your mind with regards to the lust of the flesh. I'm dead to it. With, the re with regards to the lust of highs, I'm dead to it. With regards to the pride of life, I'm dead to it. With regards to uh, committing treason against the Lord, I am dead. Completely numb to it. That's your status and your image in God's eyes. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. This message is going to set you free by the grace of God and make your prayer time more refreshing as you will create the power and the spiritual energy to enforce the manifestation of that status in your life. And this is the water of the word of God. Glory to God. In other status of Jesus that he had prior to his resurrection can be seen in scriptures like 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Isaiah chapter 53 and 54. Why? Because on the cross he took up on himself all the sin, the sickness, the poverty, the fear, the depression, anxiety, and all forms of oppression of humanity. He took it on himself. So even though before he, he hung on that cross, Yahushua wasn't sick, but when he hung, when he was hung on that cross, when he was hanging on that cross, he took on the sickness and the poverty and the lack, the insufficiency, the fears, the anxiety, and all the issues of oppressions stated in Deuteronomy chapter 28, everything latched onto his spirit, soul, and body on that cross. So Yahushua had three statuses. So there was a status of wholeness that he enjoyed prior to hanging on the cross when he hung on the cross he lost that status of holiness so Jesus on the cross of Calvary was even less than Jesus prior to being hung on the cross of Calvary
And now, after he was hung on the cross of Calvary, he took on our sicknesses, he took on our disease and poverty and lack and everything, latched onto his body, spirit, soul, and body. Because he took it on by faith, because he took our sins by faith. But after he died and he was resurrected, glory to God, he changed that status back right now. There is no sickness in Yahushua's body. There is no diseases. There are no poverty syndromes, no fears, no anxiety. All kinds of oppressions disappeared from him and God blessed open that coffin to pull him up and heal his body of any form of sickness or disease. Glory to God. Bless the name of the Lord. And right now in your status you may have sickness in your body but that sickness in your body is a lie. Hallelujah. Oh, but I feel a pain in my body. What is truth again to you? Truth is not what you see. Truth is not what you feel. Truth is not what you smell. Truth is not what any of your five physical senses tell you. What is truth? Truth is the word of God. And we're going to see right now the word of God. The Bible says Yahushua is not sick anymore. Yahushua is not poor anymore. Yahushua is not fearful. Yahushua is not in anxiety. So are you in this world right now. You are not meant to be fearful. You are not meant to be anxious. You are not meant to be full of sicknesses in your body. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for it. Your image in God's eyes. When you start thinking like that, and you want to get in your prayer closet every morning, that thought process, that pattern of thinking is going to motivate you to intercession. That I want to see the status, this, this particular classy status of Jesus realized in my life. And I understand that the realm of the natural is currently telling me a lie. Now I'm going to superimpose a higher form of reality on this lie, my circumstance, and I'm going to change it by the truth of the word of God. But if there is no status of the truth of the word of God that you can see, you are going to be out of luck on this side of eternity. There is no spiritual resource for you to superimpose on that negative circumstance if there is no status change in this regard. But thank God there is a status change. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Shout wherever you are right now. Say there is a status change in the name of Jesus. Jesus is not sick. Jesus is not poor. Jesus is not fearful. And neither should you be sick, poor, or fearful, or in anxiety. Jesus is healed. Jesus is whole. Jesus is well right now. So your body needs to be well. Your spirit needs to be whole and well in the name of Yahushua. Believe that. And enforce that on your knees through the force of spiritual arms. When you get, get in your closet to pray and exercise faith principles for it. On the cross of Calvary, Jesus took on our sickness and poverty and fear and depression, anxiety and all forms of evil. But right now, when he's seated at the right of the Father, does not have sin, sicknesses, poverty, fear, depression, anxiety, any form of sickness, any form of oppression. Death no longer has authority over him. That's the reason for it. How do we know that Yahushua is not sick right now, seated at the right of the Father? Well, it's going to be ludicrous for anybody on this side of eternity to think that Jesus right now has a headache. Or Yahushua is broke. Or Yahushua is in fear and he's nervous. It's going to be kind of ludicrous for you to think like that. But we have a document in here, Romans chapter 6 verse 9, which, which says that death no longer has power over him. And that's your answer. Death is the reason there is sickness in the physical world. Death is the reason for poverty. Death is the reason for fear. Death is the reason for anxiety. And right now, the Bible says death no longer has authority over Jesus. Romans chapter 6 verse 9. So it means that fear doesn't have authority over him. So fear cannot latch into his body anymore. Sickness cannot latch into his body anymore. Did sickness latch into Yahushua's body before hanging on the cross? The answer, of course, is no. But did sickness latch into his body when he was hanging on the cross? The answer is yes, categorically. On that cross of Calvary, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah that his body was marred, completely deformed, more than the semblance of a human being. When Jesus was hanging on the cross for 2,000 years ago, you couldn't tell that it was a human being that was hanging on the cross of Calvary because all the sicknesses of the world came on his body. And he took, took them on by faith because he took your sin and my sin by faith on the cross of Calvary. Status change.
He went from grace to grass and he's back right now to super grace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Three statuses of Jesus. And you're not going to settle for the former status, the middle status, but you are still settling right now for the latest status of Jesus. Seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? So you can enforce that reality in your circumstances. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Let's take a look at that. Glory to God. Looking at status changes. Status changes. To see yourself the way God sees you. Status changes in the name of Jesus. See yourself the way God sees you. Status changes in the name of Jesus. See yourself the way God sees you. See yourself the way God sees you. 1 Peter chapter 2. Hallelujah. In verse 22, it says, He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. He, he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And he bore our sins in his body on the cross. So he didn't take your sins before the cross. It was on the cross that Yahushua lost his right standing. And he lost his right standing by faith. So that you can get your right standing. Get his right standing back by faith in Jesus. So that we might die to sin. Getting us back to Romans chapter 6. Right now. So he took on that so our status can change. And live for righteousness. By the stripes you have been healed. Glory to God. By those stripes that he took on his body, you've been healed. That's your status right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Glory to God. Bless the name of Jesus. And in verse 9. Hallelujah. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So he was rich when he was walking here 2,000 years ago. He got on the cross. He became poor for your sake. And now he's gotten back into his rich status. And which status are you going to see yourself as? You're going to see yourself in that status of being rich in Christ Jesus. Who says Yahushua was rich when he was here? Yahushua had the ability to orchestrate circumstances to meet any need, anytime, anywhere he wanted 2,000 years ago. And that's God's kind of prosperity. Not necessarily having a trillion dollars in the bank account, but you got the power to orchestrate circumstances to meet any need. You're rich. Yahushua operated like that 2,000 years ago because he was seeing see himself being blessed. Hallelujah. See that far above all principalities, blessed with all spiritual blessings in heaven the places. He was seeing himself like that and he could download any resource he wanted on the side of eternity to 2,000 years ago. On the cross of Calvary, he lost that status, but when he died and he was raised from the dead, he picked that status right back up and he's just as rich as you are right now. You are just as rich as he is right now if you would choose to see yourself the way God sees you. Right now, your image in God's eyes. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Isaiah chapter 53. Luke had the semblance of Jesus and what Jesus went through on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. We're going to see ourselves the way God sees us today by the grace of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 50, chapter 53 and verse 10, it says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, to cause him to suffer. And some of our folks are not going to read that scripture that God can actually crush somebody. He crushed his son for your sake, and it was an action of love. It was the Lord's will to crush him. It did it on purpose so that you can get his righteousness. To cause him to suffer. And though the Lord made his life a guilt offering, he will see the offspring, his offspring, and prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. And after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By my knowledge, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and will bear their iniquities. 
Hallelujah. In verse 7, in verse 4, it says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God and spitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed again for our iniquity. The punishment that was upon him, that brought, that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb to the, to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her sharers, he is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away, and who can speak? And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. That's Yahushua's. That was Yahushua's status on the cross. But right now, he's no longer oppressed. Right now, he is no longer smitten. How do we know that? Go to Philippians chapter 2. Glory to God. Philippians chapter 2. Bless the name of Jesus. Your image in God's eyes. Glory to God in verse 6, in verse 5, it says, Your attitude should be that, the same attitude of Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in a human likeness, and being found in, a, in the appear, appearance of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and given a name that is above every name, that are the name of Yahushua, every name shall bow, of things in heaven, of, of things on earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Yahushua is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. You got to stand his back. You got to see yourself together with Yahushua with the classy status of resurrection. Glory to God. Another quality of Jesus, another status change which I'll try to take a look at is Yahushua before his resurrection had limited authority because Satan still had the keys of death and Hades, just like we read in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. And Yahushua had to take it back. But you need to realize that Yahushua did not refuse the devil's bluffs during the wilderness of temptation experience when that devil said the authority of this world was handed over to him even though that's a lie he stole it yeah we know it was handed over to him inadvertently because Adam and Eve didn't understand how you transfer authority in the realm of the spirit is by you bowing down to the devil but then we know the devil tricked them into it and they didn't convert their milk into curds so they were ignorant of that but anyway he stole that authority Luke chapter 4 in verse 5. Let's look at that. Luke chapter 4 in verse 5. Talking about uh, the devil tempting Jesus. It says the devil led him up to a high place and showed him at an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for he was given over to me. Lie, stupid lie. And I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. And Yahushua answered, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, Jesus didn't debate with the devil. He didn't say, Well, you don't have that authority. Why are you telling me you have a God? Jesus understood. The authority was inadvertently handed over to the devil. And Yahushua's mission was to retrieve that authority. Now, Yahushua executed his mission based on Revelation 1.18 that we just read over there. He took the keys of hell. The, the keys of Hades from him and the authority of the kingdoms of the world has been transferred right now over to Jesus based on the evidence of Revelation 1 18, Philippians 2 13 that we just read over there. But at the time that Jesus was here, he did not have all authority. But after he was raised from the dead, he got the keys of hell, the keys of death. And now he has all authority. And guess what? That's your status right now under Yahushua. The authority of the name of Jesus has not diminished with time. The authority of the name of Jesus increased with time. Right? Why? Because there is a status change. Let's look at Luke chapter 19. Or Luke chapter 9, rather. 
when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So Jehoshua had some authority. He had some power before his death, burial, and resurrection. But he didn't have all authority. Now let's look at all authority in Matthew chapter 28 right now. Look at it. Jesus got all authority back. In Matthew chapter 28 in verse 18, then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Just like we quote every time we want to start our service. So there is a change of status right now. There is a change of authority status. He had limited authority when he was over here 2,000 years ago, but right now he's got unlimited authority under God. Glory to God. And the Bible says you need to see yourself together with Jesus with unlimited authority under Yahushua. Why? Because he's giving you that authority right now based on Matthew chapter 28 in verse 18. All authority given over to me. Go make disciples of all nations. Status change. Glory to God, somebody. Hallelujah. There is a status change. Yahushua had limited authority because Satan still had the keys of death and Hades. But right now, Yahushua has been given a name that is above all names, and he has delegated power and authority to, to, to you to use that name in the name of Yahushua. You've got authority under Yahushua. Your status has changed. So I don't see myself... Right now as a human being with limited authority anymore. I see myself right now together with Yahushua serving in the kingdom of a God with unlimited authority. I'm changing my mindset. Hallelujah. Why is the scope of unlimited authority important for you? The scope of unlimited authority is going to bolster your faith when you go to operate like a, free, like, a, like a priest of the New Testament. When you charge before the demons and you want to take authority over them, all these thought processes are going to bolster your faith to keep the devil's tail out of the way and say, I've got all authority, I have authority over you, Satan, get out of here. But for the saints of God who doesn't know that there is a status change right now, if the disciples were able to perform many miracles within the scope of limited authority, how much more should we be performing a lot of miracles right now, even in the New Testament, when we have unlimited authority? You've got unlimited authority because status has changed right now. See yourself the way God sees you. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Another status change that we can see is that Yahushua 2,000 years ago was limited in, a, in his ability to intercede for man because he was trapped in the physical body. The Bible talked about that in the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 that Yahushua came in the form of uh, the physical body. Let's take a look at that. Hebrews chapter 2. Bless the name of Jesus. Glory to God. The shouting ground right now for you. Bless the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. It says, it says since the children have flesh and blood. He too had to share their humanity. So that by death he might destroy him. Who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery. Because of their fear of death. So Yahushua shared flesh and blood. Of this side of eternity 2,000 years ago. But when it was raised from the dead right now, he qualifies to intercede for us. So we see ourselves as members of Yahushua's body with a high priest who is constantly making intercessions for us at the mercy seat in the third heavens right now, based on Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 to 16. When Jesus was over here, there was no high priest at the right hand of the Father making intercession for him. So his job was extremely more difficult than what we have right now. 
Nobody praying for you. There is no Yahushua's dunamis to amplify his personal dunamis. He had to generate it all by himself. And yet he got the job done. Now, right now, you got personal dunamis being coupled together with Yahushua's dunamis. You should do some business on the side of eternity for the kingdom of the God you serve. You are stronger on the inside than you think. You are a victor on the inside. You can win even in the midst of the devil's situations going on in the world right now because greater is he that's in you and your status has changed. Bless the name of the Lord, child of God. Glory to God. You have authority. You are dead to sin. You are not in sickness and disease and poverty and lack. You do not have limited authority. You got unlimited authority. That's your status right now. That's the image of God image of yourself that God has at the back of his mind. And God is telling you and me in this generation, see yourself the way God sees you. Glory to God. So why is it important? Why is it important for you to appreciate what we're talking about? Why is it important for me to see myself like Yahushua's his status after his resurrection? The reason this is important is, is because this is the water of the word of God and he's going to reflect your face, the image of the believer, from God's perspective back to the believer. All through the scriptures, God's telling you, count yourself to be dead indeed out of sin. All through the scriptures, see yourself with all authority over demons, the sicknesses, and diseases. We are seeing that from God's perspective, God is telling you, come up higher. Come up higher in your mindset. Don't think like that dirt anymore. Come up higher. So that's the first reason. The second reason is in the process of seeing yourself the way God sees you, you are better positioned to realize the status of yours in this planet. And incidentally, all the patriarchs of faith who made Hebrews 11 operated like this. They had a status at the back of their minds that they were looking to superimpose on a current physical situation. And they superimposed that status to change that situation. A good example is going to be Jacob. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 30. Look at the example of Jacob in Genesis chapter 30. How Jacob superimposed a higher form of reality on a negative circumstance. That's the reason you got to see yourself this way. Genesis chapter 30 and verse 37. So Jacob, however, took fresh cut branches from poplar, almonds, and plane trees and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so that they will be directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in the heat and they came to drink, they made it in front of the branches. And they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. And Jacob set apart the young of the flock by themselves, themselves, but made the rest face the strict, the dark colored animals that belonged to Laban. Thus he made separate flocks for himself and did not put them with Laban's animals. Whenever the stronger females were in the heat, Jacob would place the branches in the troughs in front of the animals so they would make that near the branches. But if the animals were weak, he would not place them, them there. So the weak animals went to Laban and the strong ones went to Jacob. In this way, the man grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks, maid servants, man servants, and camels and donkeys. An operation of faith principles. God gave him that from a Urim and Thummim operation. He didn't just uh, he didn't just game up that idea by himself. So I'm gonna take take some branches. I'm gonna cut them and make stripes, and I'm gonna place them in front. Of, front. He didn't he didn't dream that up by himself. God gave him that instruction. Now you go try it yourself. If God didn't give you that instruction, you go take these branches and put it in front of your ship and see if your ship is going to reproduce after that. If there is no spiritual energy backing up what you said. Now you all know the story. I'm not going to belabor that point. The ultimate culmination of your faith principles should be to retrieve a corresponding physical action. 
Now that corresponding physical action, that instruction with Jacob got over here is going to be an image that Jacob is trying to superimpose on a negative current physical circumstance. But that establishes a principle right here that we're trying to talk about with regards to the water of the word of God. You need to see yourself that way. So when you pray the kingdom through every morning. And you turn to the scriptures we're talking about right now. You turn to Romans chapter 6. You turn to Isaiah chapter 54, 14. My people shall be established in righteousness. They're free and far from all oppressions of the devil. I see myself dead to sin today. I'm dead to the lust of flesh, lust of hearts, pride of life. I see all those things. God is going to deposit subsequently corresponding physical actions to you. And you will switch your attitude over right now to seeing yourself being dead to sin. A lot to God in Christ. You're going to be like that flock and you will reproduce afterwards. What you see at the mercy seeds, which is the water of the word of God. Glory to God. That's the reason seeing yourself this way is going to be important. If you do not have that mindset change, you do not have that attitude change, because there is no status change available to you for you to see yourself the way God sees you, you are going to be out of luck to change your physical circumstances that are going at odds against the kingdom of peace and righteousness and joy in your life. Well, thank God there is a status change. Glory to God. Tell somebody, my status has changed because I am in Yahushua. Glory to God. That's the reason it's important for you to see yourself this way. Because when you do that, you are better positioned to superimpose a higher form of reality on that negative circumstances. And this gets going to change when you put the pressure of faith and power on. Glory to God. Who art thou who mountain before Zerubbabel? You will become a plank. There is no divination against Israel, no enchantment, prosperous against the Jacob of God. The very, the very fundamental particle that was orchestrated in a wrong way to create a physical circumstance, you've got power and ability and resource to reorchestrate those circumstances to change it. When you see yourself the way God sees you, it's a critical reason. So we can see how that happened in Jacob's life. And God was able to, to superimpose a higher form of reality to change his negative, negative physical circumstance. That's the reason God's given us this privilege as well to see ourselves the way God sees us. And now the scripture is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And in verse 18, it says, And we with unveiled faces all behold the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the Bible says when you behold the glory of the Lord, you are going to be transformed into the image of what you are beholding. But the question is, why is it important for you to behold the glory of the Lord even though you're not yet living out the glory of the Lord? Think about that. The reason it's important is because you are going to gravitate in the direction of what you see. That's the reason you, you, you cannot afford to see yourself with the dysfunctions of your neighborhood. Don't see yourself with the dysfunctions of your humanity. Do not see yourself with the challenges of your family. You see yourself in the stars because that's where you belong. Right seated at the right hand of majesty. Far above scenes, far above sicknesses, far above poverty, far, far above. I'm talking about the way you see yourself. If the carnal and the unbelieving haven't walked up to you after you've been walking with the Lord for a number of years to tell you, you don't see yourself the way I see you, then you're not doing it right. And I've had that testimony numerous times. They're going to come to me. You don't see yourself. I mean, we, we see you in a certain way, but the way you project yourself is completely different. It messes up our theology about you, of course. I want, I want to mess up your theology about me. You blankety blank, blank, blank. Get away from me. I don't see myself like the rotten, rotten person on this world on this side of eternity. Why? Because my mind is seated together with God in heavenly places. Why? Because I want to see heaven in my world. That's the way I see myself. And you got to see yourself that way. Bless the name of Jesus. So that's a critical reason. Hallelujah. 
this another reason it's is to to see yourself this way is to understand that this is the believe confess meditate and do an aspect of the complete exercise of faith principles faith calls those things that be not as though they are you've got to have a higher form of reality that you are trying to superimpose on a current circumstance and that higher form of reality will be the status this image of Jesus seated on the right of the Father, which God is telling you to see yourself the way I see you in the name of Jesus. So how do you do this? How do you enforce the status? I've been talking about it left, right, and center. The way you enforce the status is to exercise complete faith principles for KJR to enforce the KOG with POA for AIM every day. I believe you guys can remember all those acronyms. Exercise complete faith principles for simultaneous displays of the practice of the God kind of love, kindness, and justice for the objective of righteousness. To enforce the kingdom of God in your world, righteousness, peace, and joy with the powers of agape, P-O-A for agape in motion, testimonies. That's what you do every day. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. You get in your prayer closet. You generate spiritual adage to enforce the kingdom of God for that day. You, you repent of the sins. You load your spirit. You desire the word. You pray the word. You reserve your right right now to switch your attitude to believe, confess, meditate, do and Start walking around the streets like a champion. Because you indeed are a champion inside your God who loves you. Glory to God. You stop the streets like you're confident because you are. The Bible says the wicked fleets even though nobody is pursuing them. But the righteous will be as bold as a lion. You pierce through the veil and you can see God clearly face to face and you download certain humans and torments in your heart. You're charging against that situation and telling that mountain you move in the name of Jesus. You're telling that tree you'll be pulled up out of here and be cast into the water. You mountain before Zerubbabel you will become a plane. You're going to talk to your wretch and you see wretch and you'll be split in the name of Jesus because I serve a consuming fire. My circumstances will dissipate in the heat of the power I'm generating on my inside. You be confident. You are indeed a champion. Glory to God. You take all these things we've been talking about from the ODP for about a year right now. You generate spiritual energy every morning. You stomp the streets like you're confident because you are indeed a champion. So when you prayed... The kingdom through every morning, you are going to switch over to this attitudes during number one, your desire stage, which of course is part of praying the kingdom through as well. What do you do out of this desire stage? How do you use this status during your desire stage? You are going to have a burden to enforce this particular status of Jesus in your physical world. Number one at the desire stage. That desire stage is going to get you pregnant in the realm of the spirit. So when you want to start making petition in the spirit, supplication in the spirit, there is a burden on the inside of you that you are trying to birth in the realm of the spirit. That's how you use this status at the desire stage. But after the desire stage and the praying stage, you're going to use this status on the fro journey. The tabernacle of Moses has a total component to it and has a fro component to it. When you're coming out of the tabernacle of Moses, after you've desired and prayed the word, you switch over right now to the believing phase. What is the attitude of the believing phase? The attitude of the believing phase is right now you're counting the job done. I do not carry the burden of wanting to enforce the status in my life anymore. I see the status enforced. That is the attitude of believing. And I see myself coming out into my world with corresponding physical actions and the instructions that God has given me. I see myself like that and I enforce that condition in the name of Jesus. That's how you switch to this attitude in the toe motion and in the fro motion. Desire the word in the far direction. Believe the word backward in the backward direction. And you will see the kingdom of God enforced in your life. That's how to leave the status of God's expectation for you. And of course, you're going to abide by other instructions that we've given through the ODP for the past one year. Instruction of going on, to, on your Sabbath. And making sure that you grow your righteousness quotient by putting your tunic on. 
ha tunic on, your tor uh, your tunic on, your robe on, your ephod on, your breast piece on, your sash on, your torban on, and all the things we've been talking about. You're doing all those instructions. You reserve the right to see yourself the way God sees you, and you win because of that. There is no divination against Israel, no enchantment prosperous against the Jacob of God, and through the greatness of God's power, all your enemies will bow down before you. Who art thou, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become a plague before the servants of the living God. Hallelujah. Why do the nations rage? The people imagine a vain thing against the Lord and his anointed, but he will sit in heaven, will laugh at them, and he will rebuke them in his honor. Why? Because he has the power and the breath of their nostrils in the palm of his hands. Do not be afraid, child of God. God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? You are a champion. See yourself the way God sees you. Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus, everybody. Glory, glory, glory to God. This is where I'm going to like to stop today. And this is going to conclude the online discipleship program for 2018. We wanted to thank you for staying tuned with us and staying on board. We are going to get started with the online discipleship program for 2019. So get ready and get everybody that you know has got HHF and looking for ways to operate in the wisdom of Yahushua to defeat the darkness of this world and bring them onto the call with you. And let's make a hero out of them. So I'm going to like to stop in here today. I talked about your image in God's eyes. What is your image in God's eyes. It is the status of Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The status of Jesus at the right hand of the Father is going to include Jesus not vulnerable to temptations. Jesus not sick. Jesus is not broke. Jesus is not fearful. Jesus has unlimited authority and you need to see yourself in the status as well. Why do we need to see ourselves in the status? The more we see ourselves like this, the better position we are to realize these qualities in our experiences. How how do we do that? How do we see ourselves and achieve this status in our circumstances? Exercise complete faith principles to enforce the kingdom of God in your life every day. Switch over to the status in your attitude of desiring the word as you pray and believe in the word as you come out of the prayer closet and abide by the instructions that we've given for the past one year by the grace of God. Hallelujah. So as my custom is, I'm going to give the, the viewing audience an opportunity to take a snapshot of what's on the board right now so they can study along with us. So you're welcome to pause the device that you may be using to watch this webcast right now. We could take a picture on the board as a study note so you can study along with us and I'll be back in 10 seconds. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Give him glory, somebody. I want to thank you for watching. So this is where I'm going to like to stop today. We talked about your image in God's eyes, the water aspect of the Word of God, and understand how to find subsequently for yourself water aspect of the Word of God. There are lots of articles published on HeroSmart.com. You go to HeroSmart.com, you click on the water menu over there. You are going to see all articles that you can use to see yourself the way God sees you by the grace of God. So thanks for staying on board. This is the conclusion of Heroes March Online Discipleship Program for 2018. And next week, by the grace of God, we are going to delve, delve into a little snapshot of the prophetic timeline of our generation. And in January of 2019, by the grace of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are going to get started again with the Online Discipleship Program from Heroes March. So welcome on board and get ready for grand and great opportunities at church at Heroes March. And I say, be blessed in the name of Yahushua. Amen.